What's going on everybody? I pray you're having an amazing day. Today is Sunday and we just finished a dynamic service. And if you miss Sunday, you have an opportunity to reconnect with us, to relive the moment in the service from today. We completed the fire series on today and we talked from the subject title, Check Your Temperature. You know, it's the story of the three Hebrew boys. They're thrown into a fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar turns the furnace up seven times. But even though he owned the oven, he did not control the thermostat. God controlled the thermostat. And as a result, these men were able to make progress and walk by faith, even through a fire. And no matter what your circumstance looks like right now, you can do the same. I want to encourage you to check out the message. If it blesses you, make sure you comment, make sure you share, and make sure you like. That lets us know that we're reaching you. So thank you again for this time. Make sure you go tell somebody and know this, no matter how hot it is, you can make it through. Peace. Daniel chapter 3, verse 13 through 27. It reads, Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage in order that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and to worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse... You will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, respectfully, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. But suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, Didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like a god. The Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the higher officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell like smoke. You could just praise God about that. Hallelujah. Listen, just for a few moments, I want to talk from the subject title, Check Your Temperature. Check your temperature. As we look at this story, we understand that it's a familiar passage of scripture. It's about Israel who's been taken into captivity. There were Hebrew boys that were significant in this book we call 
Daniel was one of the prophets. It was Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They made some decisions for the Lord Jesus Christ to walk in alignment with his will and his way. That when the king wanted to offer them meat and drink, they refused. And the Bible says that they become 10 times better as a result. The Bible says that as a result, they are promoted because they made a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. In this culture, they promoted pluralism. In other words, they were saying that many gods can be celebrated without the exclusion of any gods. But you know, even in New Testament, Jesus says that he's the way, the truth, and the life, that no man can go to the Father but by him. And so this becomes problematic because these men decide to stand for one God, the true God, the only living God. And as a result of the excellence that they're operating in, it created some hate. Because understand this, um, that when you operate in the spirit of excellence and you are granted favor, favor creates foes. So there's some people that don't, didn't like the way Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were moving. They didn't like the fact that God's hand was on their life and that they were moving quickly up the ranks. And so they set up a scheme and encouraged Nebuchadnezzar to create a statue. And as a result of the statue, they believed the statue deserved worship because the statue was a representation of Nebuchadnezzar. And they said, whenever you hear the music, bow. But these three men refuse to bow. And I believe there's some people here today that says, Pastor, you know what? I've been through some circumstances where I was tempted to give in. I was tempted to compromise, but I refuse to bow. Because I realized that what I compromised to get, I will ultimately lose. And so I refused to bow. And so there was a king who tried to control his territory. In fact, he attempted to have climate control. And climate control speaks to more than just your physical temperature. It speaks to the temperature of the culture. And I don't know about you, but one of the first Fights, which is an overstatement, that me and my wife had was over temperature. Because everyone wants to control climate. They want to control temperature. She, she's cold natured, so she likes it warm. I hate heat. I like it cool. And so we had great debates about who was going to have their way in our house. And in fact, you should see how we ride sometimes because they understand the division. Sometimes in the same car, you now have the ability to change your settings depending on what side of the car that you're riding. Isn't it amazing that we could be going to the same destination with two different climates? Isn't that how life is? We're all going to the same destination. But if I look around, I realize that there are many people here today that are dealing with different climates, different temperatures. Some of you are in a hot place. Some of you are in a cool place. Some of you are in an in-between place. But wherever you are, God knows. And the destination is still sure. But sometimes we have a problem with the climate because we're all going to the same place. But how many people know that it's worse um, when you go there hot. I remember one summer before I got married. Before I got married. Everybody say before I got married. You know, my air conditioning units went out. Right? My air conditioning units went out. I went a whole summer with no or without any air conditioning. A whole summer. A hot summer. Let me say that. A hot summer without any air condition. And I couldn't control the climate. I remember the only comfort I had was in my refrigerator. 
because I was trying to save up for that summer. And things got hot. And even though that's funny and some people think it's uncomfortable, that's where many of us are even in our lives. And we're dealing with some uncomfortable climates. You're in a marriage that seems to be hot. You have kids that make you hot. All of us are in situations where we're not enjoying the climate, even though we hope we're going to get to the destination. And even if, even if we look at this concept of climate control, climate control prevents things from spoiling. If you have the wrong climate, things can spoil in your house. Isn't it amazing um, that when we walk in your home because you and your spouse have not talked in weeks, we feel a draft because it's something about creating the right environment that keeps things from spoiling. This season, you got to protect the environment because certain things can't grow in the wrong environment. Certain things can't flourish in the wrong environment. And so you have to protect the environment. Look, God spent almost five days creating an environment before he creates man on the sixth day because he's about environments. And this is why you have to guard what you allow to go in your ears and out of your mouth because we have to guard environments. And so this Nebuchadnezzar, he tried to control the environment. In fact, we're dealing with global warming because of pollution. Sometimes temperatures can rise because of pollution, because some people won't recycle, because some people are wasteful, because of fumes. We all have to deal with what we call global warming. In fact, even in Greensboro, we didn't even have snow this year. I'm not mad about it, but the truth of the matter is it's a result of global warming, pollution. And I believe some things get hot because of the pollution in the culture. That things get warmer because of that. And then Nebuchadnezzar, because he has a big ego, he wanted to control the temperature. He sees what these Hebrew boys are doing, and he says, you know what? I'm mad. And watch this. He makes an impulsive decision because he's mad and upset and unnecessary people get hurt because he makes an impulsive decision. The Bible says he tells um, his workers to turn the furnace up seven times. And as a result, the people that go to throw the three Hebrew boys into the fire, they die. Isn't that amazing um, that what the enemy meant for evil, that somehow God makes it good, that the people that tried to mishandle the covenant people, God handled them in an appropriate way. The fire that was meant for the Hebrew boys ended up hurting those who threw them in. This is why you have to know who you're dealing with. You have to learn that covenant people have special privileges, uh, that God doesn't just let people handle covenant people any kind of way, that it's important um, that you deal mindful with them because God's hand and God's favor is upon covenant people. So this Nebuchadnezzar, he sought to control the climate. He was upset because even though he stripped the Hebrew boys of their name, he couldn't strip them of their identity. They still knew who they were. So he said, let me control these elements because the king's ego is built upon his power and his ability to be able to influence others. And like the Hebrew boys, we find ourselves doing furnace time. In fact, this furnace was an oven. That had doors on top as well as doors on the side. Oh, that's a prophetic word right there. Um, that no matter how hot the furnace is, that's a door. That, that means the same furnace you got into, God can give you the grace to get up out of there. I know somebody feels trapped on the day, but I want you to know there's a door. Look at somebody say, there's a door. And even if you can't find a physical door, I don't want to jump the gun, but Jesus is the door. And if you're with Jesus, you can get out of anything that the enemy tries to trap you in. And so Peter begins to remind us, and this is crazy because Peter writes this, many theologians believe this, in Babylon. He says, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. 
Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. He says, listen, man, don't think it strange that you're dealing with diverse temptations. That's what James says, because the trying of our faith really works patience. And so it's not the fire. It's really the faith that the enemy is after. And I want you to know this, that it's important to understand this concept that just because I walk by faith does not mean I won't have to walk through fire. Let me say that again. Just because I walk by faith does not mean I won't have to walk through fire. Because some people feel like if you walk in enough faith, you will never have to walk through fire. But fire is what tests your faith because many of us can talk big until we have to walk through a fire. Many of us can talk great until we have to walk through a fire. And God says, let me prove what you said because faith sometimes will lead you in the fire. Sometimes you'll find yourself in the fire because of your faith. And so when we look at this text, we can't find it strange that we're in fire. Some of you are sitting here on this morning asking God, why in the world have you put me in this fire? I've treated my neighbors right, even treated a few enemies right. So God, why did you put me in this fire? He says, your faith that led you to this fire. It's the faith that's put you in this predicament because I want to prove to you and the world what I can do through a life that's truly submitted to me. And I came here to tell somebody that just because you're going through a fire, you are not cursed. God has not turned his back on you. Maybe it's proof that God has approved you and he sees more in you than you can see in yourself. And I came to tell you that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Just like he did for the Hebrew boys, he can do the same thing for you. I wish I could just get a litmus test on the day, just to take a poll today, just to see how many people are actually in fire on this morning. Amen. Some of you came to church because you said, Pastor, I've been in fire all week, and this week I just need some relief. Some of you praise God because you said, God, I need a relief, because when you on fire, you holler a little differently. When you on fire, you shout a little differently. When you on fire, you pray a little differently. It's something about fire that pulls out the best qualities on the inside of you. When, when, when you on fire, you stop being superficial because you get your priorities in order when you on fire. Because you understand that life is precious and you take nothing for granted. So it teaches you how to be grateful. Something about the fire. So they're in the fire. Nebuchadnezzar is trying to control the fire. And even though they're in faith, they can't avoid this fire. But I love the Hebrew boys that they began to declare in unison. We don't even know who was the spokesperson for the Hebrew boys. The Bible says that they all said it. They were a chorus. They were all on one accord. In this season, you need some friends that are on one accord with you. Yeah. I'm not just talking about any type of accord. I'm talking about when you believe God, they believe God with you. And when you speak up, y'all speak up together because the truth of the matter is one can put a thousand and two can put 10,000 to flight. And we see in this text that these Hebrew boys are speaking together and they're speaking and declaring God's supremacy and God's sovereignty. I love this about the Hebrew boys because they are bosses. They say things like this. They said... Hold up, great king. We don't even feel the need to have to defend ourselves. So when you're walking in faith, you don't have to fight for yourself because you recognize it's something greater at stake. Some of you got to get to the point where you don't even have the need to defend yourself because, King, by now you should have enough evidence that our God is the true and living God. So I don't have nothing else to say to you because I am not here to promote me. I'm here to promote him. So let me talk about how sovereign and how much in control our God is and not talk about my issue. Because even though you're the king and you own the oven, God has the thermostat. And so I'm not concerned about the future because God has 
the thermostat. Look at somebody say, God has the thermostat. But you have to help God work the thermostat. See, I love a thermostat because there's a difference between the thermostat and the thermometer. I love thermostats because thermostats are in touch with reality, especially the new and updated ones. They're in touch with reality because they know how to read the climate. They know how to read the temperature. They can tell you what the temperature currently is. And some of you, you can't just live in the fairy tale land where you the gate was happening in reality. That's not what faith is. Faith doesn't negate or dismiss what's happening in reality, but faith has the ability to change reality. And so understand this, that a thermometer and a thermostat have the ability both to read the temperature. And that's what some of you do. All you know how to do is just tell us what's going on in your life. Yeah, yeah. You, you know how to tell us about all of your storms. And you can tell us how it's a small world after all. And nobody knows the troubles you've seen. And you can tell us all of that stuff. And you cry us a river. Because you can tell us what your circumstance is. And all, if all you can do is tell us what your circumstance is, then you're just a thermostat. I mean, a thermostat or a thermometer because God's called us to do more than just read our circumstances. There was a woman with an issue who had a circumstance that had followed her for 12 long years, but she just didn't stay there in that circumstance. She said, if I may touch the hem of his garment, then I would be made whole. There was a woman, Sarah, who had been barren for the majority of her life. Now she was a senior citizen, but she still hoped against hope and believed God to do the impossible because she was not just reading her scenario. Can I submit this to you? The reason some of us are depressed is because we keep on reading our scenarios. We can tell you why we're in the predicament we're in. We play the blame game. It was my mother. It was my father. It was my job. It was my first boyfriend. It was my last husband. We are always blaming somebody because all we can do is read the circumstance. We can talk about who doesn't like us, but we have a problem talking about who's for us. Yeah, we just read in the circumstance. And then we sometimes we call it real, but everybody that's real is not right. And there's a difference because if all we can do is read the climate, we're no better than a thermometer. And God's saying you got to do more than just read your circumstances. You got to do more than just analyze how much debt you're in. You got to just do more than analyze your age and your situation and your circumstance. You got to do more than just analyze the fact that you're in a fiery furnace and Nebuchadnezzar has raised the temperature up seven times. You have to do more than that if you're going to get through this furnace. So you got to check your temperature. Got to check your temperature. Many of us came with some real issues on today, some real burdens on today that's got us hot, that's made us feel uncomfortable. But you got to do more than just read your situation. Yeah, because even the world can read in their current predicament. But it takes a believer to do more. Look at somebody say, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I can do more than read. So it reads. But this is the thing I love about the thermometer and the thermostat. The thermometer can only read, but the thermostat reports. Yeah, we, we have a thermostat behind the screen. We have thermostats all over the building. And, and one thing I ask my wife every time I get into an uncomfortable predicament I say, did you touch the thermostat? Um, Because it's a little hotter than what I'm accustomed to. I know where it was the last time I touched it, but it seemed like you adjusted it. And can I submit this to you? Sometimes in your home, when the climate is not right, you got to ask them, did you touch the thermostat? Because it seems a little chilly here. It seems a little hot. Because watch this. The Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. When you set your thermostat. Let me go in and preach that for a second. You've got to set your thermostat. 
That's a whole message in itself. Because if you just let your thermostat set itself by default, it's going to lead you places you never intended to go. You got to set your thermostat. I said set your thermostat. You can't be in your house complaining about how hot it is and you never set your thermostat. You've got to set your thermostat. Can't talk about how depressed you are if you haven't set your thermostat. You have to set your thermostat. That's very important. That's what Cap says. You have to set your thermostat. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. So watch this. Hope is how I set my thermostat. Watch this. If you don't have any hope, you can't set your thermostat. I love the Hebrew boys because even though they're going through a hot place, they said God is still able to deliver us out of your hand. I set my thermostat. Some of you would have said, well, God has forsaken me. I guess bowing won't hurt. But these men said, no, I'm going to set my hope on deliverance even though I'm going through a tight place right now. And I think somebody needs to check your thermostat on the day to make sure it's set right. Some of you are going through some hard situations and you got to set your thermostat on praise. Isn't that what the writer said? I will bless the Lord at all times and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. Isn't that what the writer says? And everything give thanks for this is the will of God concerning you. Watch this. It doesn't mean everything good is going to happen in your life, but it does mean I made a decision that no matter what happens in my life, I'm going to give God praise. See, some of us have a faith that says only if we gave God an ultimatum, only if you do this, I'll bless you. God, give me a sign. And see, that's why you're stuck in the fire, because you have an only if. If you heal my bodies, I'll teach transgressions your ways, and sinners will be converted. Yeah, that's our only if. And that's why you're stuck, because what if the if never happens? Only if I find the love of my life will I commit to you. God says, listen, who are you to give me an ultimatum on how I'm going to work things out in your life? The Hebrew boys knew better than to give God an only if. They gave God an even if. Even if I'm single for the rest of my life, God, I'm going to be faithful to you. God, even if I'm broke, busted, and disgusted because I have you, I have everything I need. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold, even if. Even if my kids never come back home, I'm going to bless you because you're the ones that gave me the kids in the first place. I'm not going to allow the enemy to steal my joy because I have an even if instead of an only if. Even if the locust eats up my harvest, even if all the cattle were released from my stall, I'm still going to trust in you. I got to even if. Job said, yea, though you say me, yet will I trust in you. Job had an even if. The problem with many of us, we're stuck because we have an only if, but we don't have an even if. Even if no one ever knows my name, I'm still committed to serving you. Even if all my dreams are not realized, I'm still going to give you the best of my ability because I don't have an only if type of relationship. I got an even if. Even if you don't give me all the answers to my questions, I'm still going to serve you. Even if they never say I'm sorry, I'm still going to forgive. Sometimes we're stuck because we have an only if mentality and an only if faith when we should have an even if faith. Even if my spouse never becomes who I want them to be, I'm going to love them as you love the church and gave their life, gave your life for them. Because some of us got an only if and not an even if. And the reason the Hebrew boys were able to get through the fire it's because they didn't have an only if. They had an even if. An even if. Because watch this. The first sign of trouble, we backslide. Because we have an only if. And not an even if. We question God. Because we have an only if. And not an even if. How do you trust God when you don't know his next move? Watch this. They said, God, you're going to deliver us out of his hand. They didn't put God in the box of how he was going to do it. 
Because one thing about God, he's always going to be a deliverer. He can cease to be a deliverer because delivery is in his DNA. The problem we have, he doesn't always deliver us the way we want him to deliver us. This is why many of us are upset with God right now, because he delivered us in a way we didn't want. He doesn't just deliver us uh, from the fire, but he delivers us out of the fire. That means sometimes you got to go through what you can't go around. The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from them all. We don't have a problem with deliverance. We just have a problem with the method. Because God is always a deliverer. Look at somebody say, God will always make a way. He will always make a way. He be making ways out of no way. Shameless plug. The truth of the matter is God will always make a way. We just have a problem with the way he makes. He spits the Red Sea, but God, what if it crashes while I'm walking through? We don't like the way he makes. But he always makes Away. Some, of y'all, some of y'all grew up in a house where you were hungry and your mom gave you some food that you didn't have a taste for. She said, either you're going to eat that or you're going to starve. It wasn't that she didn't make a way. You just didn't like the way she made. Because you don't have an even if. You have an only if. And many of us are stuck because we haven't gotten to the place where we say, God, even if. The sun don't shine. I'm going to trust you. Let me ask you a question. Why are you stuck in the fire and miserable? Maybe it's because of a mentality. Because you feel like you deserve better and got it worse. But if you have an even if, an even if, an even if, you can get through anything. Even if I got to go by myself. Some of y'all say, I'm not going to be committed unless I, unless I have 10 friends. God said, you got to get the point where you say, even if. Even if nobody appreciates me, I'm going to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of God. Even if. I'm talking about fireproof faith. Only if. Yeah. Because you can get through anything if you have an even if. Even if you never heal my body from cancer, I'll still show forth the praises of him who brought me out. See, I know why you're not clapping because you got an only if. But if you got an even if, you made up in your mind that God is worthy regardless of what I go through. And I just want you to take a few moments on this morning just to give God an even if praise. Even if I don't get the raise, even if I don't get the job, even if I don't get the promotion, I'm giving you an even if. Even if I never had a house on the hill, I'm grateful that you went on a hill a long time ago called Calvary and paid the price for me. Even if. We're stuck because we have only a please be seated. But I need an even if. Even if my success doesn't look like I imagine, I can still follow you. Some of us have been waiting to exhale because we have an only if. We think God has been unfaithful because we have an only if. And I've been there where you had an only if. But God's ways are not your ways. His thoughts are not your thoughts. They're above your thoughts. And sometimes the thing you think is deliverance is really bondage. Because you can't see the truth. You can just see the facts. So you got to trust God with the even if. He said, God, I'm going to give you the ability to be creative on how you deliver me. You know what Jonathan said? Jonathan said, you can deliver us by many or you can deliver us by few. But one thing about it, the Lord will deliver us. Anybody ever felt like God led you to a trap, but it really was your deliverance? Because can I say this about heat? Heat will reveal hearts. You don't really know who has a heart for you until you get into some heat. 
See, y'all all lovey-dovey couples until you get in a heated discussion. Then you start calling people out of their names. Then you start saying what you really think. You really can see people's hearts when you get them hot. That's why stuff slips when they get mad because you can see people's hearts when they get hot. That's why you need to, in a date relationship, you need to see somebody hot. Because when you see hot, you get the truth. When you see hot, you get to see self-control. When you get hot, you can see resistance. And so the truth of the matter is God will put you in a hot place so you can see hearts. Because friends like Jesus show up when it gets hot. Phonies disappear. I came to tell you. That's why you got to learn to give thanks because all things are working together for the good of them that love God and that are called according to his purpose. I got to move. But I wish we could mature to a place where we were even if church. Not only if. Because God will deliver. Look at somebody say, God will deliver. So it reports. A thermostat is only as strong and as powerful as the force it's connected to. You can buy a thermostat for $30 from Walmart. But that doesn't mean you're going to have cool air. You can have a battery in it and set it. But if it's not connected to a cooling or a heating system. Now watch it. It works both ways. Sometimes our mentality can determine whether we cool a situation or we heat it up. Because of the power. Watch this. So watch this. A thermostat reports to a higher power. This is what the Hebrew boys do. They understand I have the ability to set my thermostat. But my thermostat is connected to a greater power that you can't see. So I set my hope. But my hope is not the substance. That's what Cap says. He says my hope is not the substance. Hope has no substance. That's why we lose hope so quickly. Hope can fleet. But faith has substance. And faith is the substance of things hoped for. I got to set my hope, but I got to connect my hope to some substance. Because if I don't connect my hope to my substance, it won't materialize. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. So some of you are hating because you see the thermostat set high. But you don't know we got to connect it to a power that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. So watch this. They said we're going to report to a higher power. Because again, old king, you may own the oven, but our God controls the thermostat. And we're going to set our affections. We're going to set our minds. We're going to set our thermostat. And we're going to believe God to do what he said he was going to do. That's why I'm going to call myself prosperous even when I'm stricken with poverty. Because it's connected with another power. And watch this. God begins to change my situation. And some of you have been frustrated because the season and the climate hasn't changed as fast as you wanted it to. You know, I got a thermostat at the house. Sometimes I turn the air off because it's cool outside. But when... But, but when it gets hot, I try to turn it back on. Now, it doesn't become cool right away. But if I keep it set long enough, eventually my environment will change. The reason our environments have not changed is because we haven't had our emotions, our minds, our thoughts, and our goals set long enough. But if you set it long enough, if you set your affection, God will begin to open doors that no man can shut and shut doors that no man can open if you would just set your affection. And so watch this. These Hebrew boys have set their affection. They have set their minds. They have set their hope on Jesus Christ because their hope was built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And as a result, they had a substance. They had the ability. Their substance was, in, was the fact that God can deliver. My hope is he's for deliverance, but my substance is the fact that God will be the deliverer. Because guess what? This system doesn't work if it's not. A thermostat doesn't work if it's not connected to a system. Let me ask you a question. Why didn't your hope work the last time? That's why you gave up hope because maybe all you had was a thermostat that was not connected to a system. But when your thermostat is connected to a system, we read the thermostat. The thermostat reports what your desire is, but it's the system that makes it happen. 
God is delivered. It was hot in that furnace. But the Hebrew boy said, we're going to set our thermostat. That even though it's hot, we're not going to bow. Even though it's hot, we're not going to question God. Even though it's hot, we're going to believe God to deliver us. And they set their thermostat. And lo, and behold, the fourth man showed up in the fire because they set the thermostat. I don't know who I'm talking to, but God's about to show up in your fire. Because the last thing your thermostat's going to do is regulate. This is why he'll never put more on you than you can bear because he's in your fire. I'm so grateful that God is a very present help in the time of trouble. And sometimes the fire reveals God more than anything else. This is what the Hebrew boys declared that God could do. The Hebrew boys said this, that our God is willing and our God is able. Look at somebody say willing and able. You know, there was a farmer who had two mules. Willing and able. Willing was willing, but willing was not able. And able was able, but able was not willing. And the farmer realized he couldn't get any work done because he had able and willing. God says, I'm not just able or willing. I'm able and willing. See, some people will the best in your life, but they don't have the ability to bring the best in your life. Some people will great days for you, but they don't have the opportunity to bring great days to you. God says, I'm able and I'm willing. This is what you got to understand, that some of you are in the trap and you question whether God is willing. God says, I'm going to deliver you if it's the last thing I do because I'm willing and able. Why don't you give God praise if you know that he's a willing and able God? I love Jesus because Jesus is dealing with a sick person. He asked him the question. He says, do you believe that I am able? And I came here to reaffirm my faith that I believe that God is willing and able. I know we've been through some dark seasons. I know we've been through some dark places. But I came to reaffirm my faith that God, you are willing and God, you are able. And sooner or later, things are going to work in my favor. Sooner or later, you're going to cause me to come out of this hot place because you are willing and you're able. Look at somebody say, God is willing and able. This is why the job is going to get done, because he's willing and able. That's why he's not going to leave you in the furnace, because God is willing and able. That's why your life is about to turn around, because God is willing and able. That's why God's about to open some big doors for you, because he's willing and able. That's why he's going to heal your body, because he's willing and able. That's why he's going to save your family, because he's willing and able. That's why he's going to turn your financial situation around, because God is willing and able. That's why by this time next year, you're going to be married, because God is willing and able. That's why God's going to use you mightily like you want to be used because God is willing and God is able. I came and declare that everybody feels defeated. Not only is God able, but God is willing. And if you feel a little old school this morning, say, God, have your way. Y'all didn't say it like a Pentecostal church. I need you to say it like a Pentecostal church and say, God, have your way. Because I believe that you're willing and you're able. Say, God is willing and God is able. And he's going to get the job done. And I came to prophesy to you that just like Jesus stepped in their situation, that Jesus is about to step in your situation because he's willing. He's able. He's able to regulate it so that you're able to endure it. Watch this. He does something powerful. He takes the heat out of the fire. Because he's not only a mind regulator, but he's a trial regulator. And he knows how much you can take. And he knows how much you can bear. This is why you got through some stuff that you felt like was going to be the end of you. Because God was a regulator. 
That's why you thought that last lie was going to be the end of you, but God gave you another chance because he's a regulator. That's why you thought that last scare in your body was going to take you out of here, but God healed your body again. If he hasn't healed your body according to the doctor's report, God has sustained you and kept you because God is a regulator. You thought you was going to walk away from that marriage, but somehow you're still there because even though your emotions were out of control, God regulated your emotions because God is a regulator. Look at somebody say, God will regulate your circumstance. He will regulate the climate because he's trying to show them I can take the heat out the fire. I can take the hunger out of the lion. That's what we learn in Daniel. That even something that has the ability to take you out. God says, I'm omnipotent and I'll take the power away from it. Because watch this, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't see Jesus without the fire. This is why he allows you to go through the fire. It's because he wants somebody to see Jesus. That's what Peter says. Peter says, no fire, no glory. Glory is when the whole world sees Jesus. This is why Paul reminds us the suffering of this present day is not worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed. And I came here to prophesy. If it was a shouting church, I'll tell you, there shall be glory after this. I said, that's a big statement. That means you're not going to die in this. That's going to be an after this. And I came in to prophesy to somebody. It's about to be a surprise ending. What the enemy meant for evil, God's about to make good. If you believe it, I want you to give God some praise on this morning. Come on, if you're ready for the glory. If you're ready for the glory. If you're ready for the glory. You ready for the glory? A thermometer can check the temp. A thermostat can change the temp. If you're ready for the glory. Here's the thing I love about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar gives God a standing ovation. Because it really wasn't about the Hebrew boys. It's about God getting a message to Nebuchadnezzar. And he calls them something. He says, you are the most high God. Can I read Psalms 91 verse 1 through 4? They can get it on the screen. New Living Translation. It reads like this. It says, those who live in the shelter of the most high will find rest in the shadow of the almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Nebuchadnezzar didn't know he was prophesying, that he was looking at the Most High. And the reason the Hebrew boys didn't get burnt is because God was sheltered. Has anybody ever had the testimony that God has been sheltered from the rain? That just because I didn't come in wet doesn't mean I didn't go through a storm. God's been my shelter. And I came here to tell somebody on this morning that God's got you covered. God's got you covered. God's got you covered. Prophesy to somebody. Say, God's got you covered. 